House of Squibb presents Academy Award. Tonight, Peter Lawford and Joan Loring in Enchanted Cottage. Every week, Squibb brings you Hollywood's finest. The great picture plays, the great actors and actresses, techniques and skills chosen from the honor roll of those who have won or been nominated for the famous Golden Oscar of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. For generations, the House of Squibb has been known for the high quality and unfailing dependability of its products, each the result of a never-ending quest for perfection. Today, the great family of Squibb products reflects the tremendous advance of science in its contribution to human health and well-being. The name Squibb stands for progress through research. Squibb is a name you can trust. Tonight, Squibb brings to Academy Award Enchanted Cottage, the charming love story which, in 1945, was nominated for an Academy Award. In our cast tonight, you will hear the popular young star, Peter Lawford, and Joan Loring, who, as Best Supporting Actress of the Year, was also nominated for a 1945 Academy Award. <laughs> I suppose you could call this the first public performance of my new tone poem, The Enchanted Cottage. I'd counted on Laura and Oliver being here, because it's their story, really. From the first time I became aware of it in the moonlight, I sensed its inherent magic. Although, being blind, I could see the cottage only with the inner eye of imagination. The cottage was all that was left of a great estate built upon these New England shores by an English nobleman. He used it to lend to young married couples to live in as long as they wished. But by the time I first came upon it, this gracious tradition had been abandoned and almost completely forgotten. The present day owner, I had learned, was a lone widow, Mrs. Abigail Minnett who kept her distance and made others keep theirs. It was not until Mrs. Minnett took in Laura Pennington to live and help her with the house that I realized she meant to rent it to a young married couple and the secret of the enchanted cottage might at last be revealed to me. These people who are renting the cottage, Mrs. Minnett, are they a honeymoon couple? Please don't ask that. Oh, I was hoping you were going to renew the old tradition. That tradition is broken. I broke it. Oh. This cottage was deeded to my husband as a wedding present. It was to have been our home, Tom's and mine. Only I've had to stay here alone. Nearly 25 years. Do you know what loneliness is? Yes. I thought you might. You're such an ugly girl. I know. That's why when I heard you were back... Oh... They're here. You open the door for them. Hello. Anybody at home? Come in, please. Oh, I, I hope I'm not too early, Mrs. Minnett. I brought Miss... Oh, I'm sorry. Darling, this isn't Mrs. Minnett. I'm Oliver Bradford. I stopped by last week and persuaded Mrs. Minnett to rent us the cottage. I know. I'm Laura Pennington. Hello, Mr. Bradford. Oh, there you are, Mrs. Minnett. This is Miss Alexander. How do you do? Would you like to see the upstairs? You go ahead, Beatrice. I've seen it. Very well, Oliver. I'll take your coat. Thank you. You must have been here quite a while with Mrs. Minnett. Oh, no, I came only this morning. Oh, but you, you seem to belong here. Well, you see, I was born in the village and lived there for many years. When I was a child, I heard all the stories about the cottage. It was like, well, like living near a fairy tale. Well, next thing you'll be telling me, the cottage is haunted. Oh, no, it's not haunted. It's, it's, it's enchanted. It comes to the same thing, doesn't it? Not at all. Haunted, that's to be restless and uneasy and afraid. It's, 
It's ugly. But enchantment, that's to be happy and gay. It's beauty. You see, all the people who lived here loved one another. They all found their heart's desire. Here on the old window, their names. Young men and women who in this very room pledged to love each other forever. Oliver! Hello, darling. I've been hearing about enchantment. Seems that we're to live under a happy spell. I'll admit this is all very charming, but I had thought we might have spent our honeymoon in Santa Barbara or Bar Harbor. Oh, nonsense. Not when I found you true enchantment. Well, Mrs. Minnett, are you ready for us? There are a few routine questions I've got to ask, of course. Oh, my dear Mrs. Minnett, I've filled out so many forms during the past two weeks, I can tell you anything you want to know about me, complete with photostats. Mr. Bradford means that he's applied for a commission in the Army Air Corps. He's a flyer. Oh. Yes, you're going to have us on your hands for quite a spell. At least until I get my commission. But I don't expect that for three months. It may be sooner than you think. <sighs> Look, it's December. I won't be hearing from Washington for at least three months. Not with that red tape. Oh, by the way, darling, will you let me have your ring? My ring? Yes. Now that we're going to settle down here for a bit, I think we ought to keep up with all the old traditions. What are you talking about? Just give me the diamond. You'll find out. Oliver, my diamond, it came out of the setting when you tried to cut with it in the glass. I really don't understand what you're trying to do. I wanted to cut our names in the window with the others. I suppose if I was superstitious, I'd regard this as a warning that we shouldn't marry at all. You're not married yet, that's why. Only honeymoon couples may write their names on that window. Well, I'll write our names on the windows as soon as we come back. They're gone, Mrs. Minnett. Such a nice young couple. And they said they'd be married on... Why, Mrs. Minnett, your calendar's way off. Today is December 7th, 1941. And your calendar says April 6th, 1917. Mrs. Minnett, you're just 24 years, 10 months, and one day off schedule. Oliver didn't come back to claim his cottage, nor his honeymoon, for he had no chance to get married. Only time for war. Laura stayed on with Mrs. Minnett and did what she could for the war, washed dishes in a serviceman's canteen. But that's all she could do, for the boys never asked her to dance. Perhaps it was too much to expect a man with precious leave to spend a few minutes of it with such an unattractive girl. Then one spring night, Laura came home, tried to sneak off, sorely hurt, to her room in the cottage. <laughs> Laura. Oh, I, I didn't see you. It, it's so late. I've been waiting for you. No use to cry, girl. It's not for some of us, for you and me to try to live like other people. You think you can sometimes, but there's always the world to remind you. All the things that other people take for granted, you've got to make up your mind and your heart. They're not for you. Yes, I, I know now. You've got to find something else to take their place. That's why I wanted you to be here, because there's something here for you that there isn't any place else. A place where no one can hurt you. You understand? Yes. Yes, I understand. I knew someone would come tonight. Hmm. It's a telegram. Delivered at this time of night. Would like cottage for indefinite period. Arriving today, Oliver Bradford. Bradford? Why, that was his name. Oh, then they did get married after all. Imagine they're remembering the cottage all this time. Why, it's been over a year. Mrs. Minnett, there is something about this cottage, isn't there? There is indeed. Needs a good cleaning if he's coming back. Right now. We've been here exactly one hour in this silly cottage. It's useless, even if he is only my stepson. I tell you, it's useless. He won't even talk to us. Maybe Mrs. Price can reason with him. Uh, Mother, how did he act towards you? He won't even unlock the door. He told me to go away. Well, then it's up to you, Beatrice. You must bring him to his senses. Of course, he is pretty badly smashed up, 
But I've told him a hundred times there's no use becoming a mental case over a little injury. He ought to realize there are thousands of cases worse than this. Oliver. Please, Oliver, it's Beatrice. Won't you talk to me? Won't you, please? I meant what I said the other day. We can be married. I'll look after you. I'll try to make you a good wife. Why did we have to have this terrible war? You see, Oliver, that first day when you came home, no one had told me. And when you turned and looked at me, I, I wasn't prepared. That's why I thought I'd... Oliver, I can't help it if I'm weak. I tried to be brave, really, I did. I did try. I did. Oliver. Oliver. They're gone, oh, thank God. Now let's get it over with. Why not? No use going on like this. No use in the world. No, don't. Give me that gun. Very well, if you want. But I'd be grateful, miss, if you'd mind your own business. I... Oh, look here, I'm, I'm sorry I said that. But don't you understand? Do you think I want people to see me the way I am? You saw me before. Doesn't the change shock you, repel you at all? No. Oh, you can't know. You can't realize what it is to face life like this. Disfigured. Ugly. I'll bring you your supper, Mr. Bradford. Mrs. Minnett is a very good cook. Thank you. Perhaps it was the enchantment of the cottage making itself known at last, but little by little, Oliver seemed to change. Even my efforts at first seemed to bear little fruit, that I too had been a war flyer, that I'd been blinded in the Argonne, that I'd found in music an answer to the despair that eats the soul. All this seemed to leave Oliver untouched. It must have been Laura alone who got him to take walks, to talk, to study life again. At least when I saw him at all, he was with her. I... I knew you were here by the sea. I, I thought you might... Well, that you might not want to be alone. These past few weeks, well, I had an idea that... the walks we took and talking to me, I... I hoped I was being of some help to you. And so I thought that... if you needed help now, I, I would I had be a letter from my mother and my stepfather. They feel it's not good for me to be alone, to be in a position where I brood too much. So they've given me my choice. I can come home and have the benefit of their loving care and attention oh, but... 24 hours a day, or they're prepared to make the supreme sacrifice and come here and live with me. Oh, but they can't. Why, nothing could be more damaging to you than to have oh, them here now. I can't face it. I won't face it. But there's no way I can get away from them unless... Laura... Laura, you don't get on a man's nerves. I've had proof that you don't, day after day. Don't be startled at what I'm going to say to you. Will you marry me? If you want to marry to get rid of your family, there must be dozens of girls who'd suit your purpose better than I would. Oh, do you think I have such a great choice? A hideous casualty for the rest of my life? I understand. I get the chance because there aren't so many. Oh, I'm a blundering fool. I wouldn't have hurt you for anything in the world. I'm... I'm sorry. It, it was stupid of me to be upset. You see, it isn't as if I weren't aware of my ugliness. But there's only one thing you've overlooked. Of course, you would never have understood. Women like me, conscious as we may be of our defects, we, we find refuge in dreams. Merciful dreams in which we're as lovely and desirable as any woman in the world. It's cruel to destroy those dreams. I... I only felt that no woman in the world would marry me except out of compassion. I know you have a lot of that. I promise to try not to be too much of a burden. I, I like being with you. I like to hear the sound of your voice, your laughter. 
I'm not offering you much, but, well, we're sort of in the same boat. I've got to keep on hoping that you'll say yes. I don't want to say yes just because you want a wife and I happen to be here. Don't you see? Yes, yes, I see. I see that you couldn't possibly care enough. But I do care. That's the reason. Oh, Laura. Bless you, Laura. Bless you forever and ever. Before continuing with part two of Academy Award, we wish to thank RKO Pictures for making this story available. RKO are also producers of Nocturne, starring George Raft and Lynn Berry. And now, The House of Squibb presents part two of Academy Award, starring Peter Lawford and Joan Loring in Enchanted Cottage. They were married quietly, Oliver and Laura, and they lived on in the cottage. I'd been away on a recital tour, and when I got back, there was a note awaiting me. It said, something extraordinary has happened, and Laura and I need your advice. Please come to see us as soon as you arrive, Oliver. Naturally, I went over that very evening. Good evening, Mr. Hillgrove. Good evening, Mrs. Minnett. Um, where are Mr. and Mrs. Bradford? Out for a walk. I haven't seen them since the wedding. I say, what's happened to this room? It feels different to me somehow. It's the flowers, maybe. No, it's, it's more than that. Uh, tonight I got rather an odd note. Tell me, Mrs. Minnett, what's happened to your young couple that's so extraordinary? I can't tell you. Didn't they go away on a honeymoon? They're spending it right here in the cottage. You'll be the first person they've seen since their marriage, except me. Oh. They keep to themselves all day. When they do go out at night, they wrap themselves up and cover their faces. Shh. They're coming now. John! Hello, John. Hello, you two. It's so good to see you again. In fact, I think we should have died if we'd had to wait for you much longer. What's this all about? What is all this mystery? John, John, it may be insane... But, well, we, we, we sent for you because you're the only one we can trust. Let me, Oliver. Well, it's about this cottage, John. You know my feelings about it. There's something strange here, something... But what so... has it to do with you and Oliver? What is this thing that has happened to you? Well, it's, it's something... Well, something pretty nearly incredible. We've changed, John. Well, I may not be able to see, but I can tell that from your voices. You feel different because you're happy. Oh, it's more than that. It, it's a physical change. The day we were married and we came home, it, it was later that night and, and we were finishing dinner. Our wedding dinner. It was a farce, a tragic farce. He was my husband, but how could he ever know that I loved him from the first day he came to the cottage? I would never be able to tell him all that was in my heart, for he could never love me as I loved him. I got up and went to the piano. The very first notes I struck were, were like the touch of a magic wand. There was a new warmth, a new radiance. I could feel the room changing. And as I played, the feeling of enchantment spread, embracing everything around me. I turned and, and looked at Oliver. He was just as I saw him the first day when he was everything I'd ever dreamed of. Suddenly I thought, how could I fool myself I could be the bride of such a man as this? I had to run away from him. I couldn't let him see my tears. I followed Laura upstairs. <laughs> my heart went out to her. Suddenly I realized how much she had come to mean to me. I took her in my arms to reassure her. She was changed. It was no trick of the moonlight. She was beautiful. Radiantly beautiful, like she is now. 
That was when we knew. I think I understand. But I'm afraid. I'm so afraid it's some kind of trick. John, I couldn't stand to be ugly again for Oliver. Oh, my darling. What do you think, John? The storm is passing over us. You shan't have to worry. She knows. She never looks at us. She avoids us as we avoid her. But she knows about the change. This cottage belongs to her. She lives in its past. She knows its secret. Laura? Oliver? Yes, John? You asked for my advice. Yes. Take this gift and enjoy it without question and without fear. Accept it humbly as a heaven-sent miracle. And be grateful for it. A miracle? Yes. You've both been touched by a power which is beyond this world. Accept your blessing. Don't talk to anyone about it. It belongs to you. Guard it closely. And permit no one to shatter it. Laura, John, they're coming. My mother and stepfather. Oh, how nice. I know, darling. I saw the wire. Frankly, I'm sorry I didn't make the gesture of inviting them myself. I have a simply dreadful reason for being glad they're coming. Of course, I want them to see how happy we are, but particularly I want them to see that Oliver didn't do so badly in marrying me. Won't it be wonderful, John, showing Laura off, watching them admire her? <laughs> Oliver, um, don't you think your mother and stepfather ought to be prepared for what's happened to you? Oh, yes, you, you may be right. I feel that if they were told in advance, um, gently... About the miracle? Well, I, I think you ought to let me try and explain it to them. Wonderful. I must get dressed. You're a darling, John. Come on, Oliver, and don't take long dressing. So you see, Mrs. Price, your son Oliver and Laura are on the verge, on the borderland of the greatest happiness they've ever experienced. But they've changed, changed greatly, and I know that that change as they see it is not as you'll see it. Girl, I'm afraid I really don't understand. You're talking in riddles, Hillgrove. Let me put it this way, then. When they come down those stairs, no matter what they say or do, will you act along with them, please? They don't know it, but they're playing a part. Play a part with them. Pretend that the change is as great as they imagine it is. I knew something like this would happen. Where is Oliver? Oliver! Oliver! Please, Mrs. Price, please. Oliver! We're coming. Please remember, the next few minutes may be the most important in their lives. You hold that chance of happiness in your hands. Oh, there's entirely too much mystery about this whole thing to suit me. Well. Oliver, darling. You know my wife, Laura, mother. I'm so glad you've come to see us, Mrs. Price. How do you do? Won't you sit down? I'll ring for Mrs. Minnett. She's prepared a lovely tea. Wait until you taste her scones. I've tried to make them myself, but I'm afraid it takes years of learning. Oh, this is going to be a real party. A memorable occasion. Actually, because you're the first. Outside of John here, there's nobody else who knows. Now, look here, Oliver. I really oh, think... Oh, Freddie. Oh, we must shock you. But you'll get used to the change. You won't even remember us as we were. Laura and I joke about it now ourselves. Why, it's difficult for us to remember. Mother, what is it? Oh, my poor boy. You poor, poor darling. Mother, just because you're happy, there's no reason to cry. No, forgive me, darling. I love you so much, Oliver. And if you're really happy, I, I guess that's all that matters. And I'm glad he married you, Laura, dear. Because it's clear you're such a loyal girl and has so much to give him. Oh, so much more than just a pretty girl. And Freddie and I will be with you both as often as we can, of course. But it won't be necessary for you to go and see people or... How do you like your tea, Mrs. Price? Lemon or cream? Oh, you mustn't bother about tea, Laura. You really mustn't. I, I couldn't swallow a mouthful. I've got an awful headache coming on. You'll excuse us, won't you, if we just run along... Goodbye, you poor darling. Come along, Frederick. Mrs. Minnett, you've always known about us, haven't you? Yes. You never noticed any change in us? No. 
Why didn't you tell us before? Well, when I knew you'd have to find out the truth this afternoon, I thought my heart would break. But now that you know, would you have had me tell you sooner? There was nothing I could have done or can do now. And yet, what is there really to be sad about? Shall I tell you the secret? Shall I? Tell us. Please tell us. You love each other. You've fallen in love. And a man and a woman in love have a gift of sight that isn't granted to other people. To each other, you are beautiful, because you are in love. And that's the charm. That's the secret to the only enchantment this cottage holds. And it's of your own making. Darling, you'll always be beautiful to me. Nothing can ever change the way I feel about you. You know that? Yes, dearest. I know. Oliver, dear, we've never written our names on the old window. Let me have your ring, dear. You know, somehow I think the others would want us to now. Forget it's December for a moment, the first time you try refreshing Squib Dental Cream. For Squib Dental Cream brings you a sense of exhilarating freshness as welcome as the clear, cool air of a morning in May. And you can enjoy the quick refreshment of Squib Dental Cream anytime. For in the simple act of brushing your teeth with this delightfully different dentifrice, you sense a fragrant mintiness, a brisk tingling action you've never known before. Squib Dental Cream leaves your mouth feeling fresh and young and clean. And your smile will seem younger and brighter, too. For Squib Dental Cream sweeps away the dullness that hides the natural luster of your teeth. So give your charm a change. Give it the protection of Squib Dental Cream, one of the great family of Squib products. Taste, feel, and see the refreshing difference. Next Wednesday, another great picture. The House of Squib will present Academy Awards starring... Margaret O'Brien in Lost Angel. Today's performance of Enchanted Cottage was written for radio by Frank Wilson. Leith Stevens conducted and adapted our musical score from the original by Roy Webb. Our producer-director is D. Engelbach. Peter Lawford appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Academy contender The Yearling, starring Gregory Peck and Jane Wyman. Joan Loring will soon be seen in the Enterprise production The Other Love. This Christmas, every Christmas... The greatest gift of all is health. Buy Christmas seals and give health. Remember, you're helping to stamp out tuberculosis when you buy Christmas seals. Send your contribution tonight. This is Hugh Brundage bidding you good night until next Wednesday at the same time when you're invited to listen again to Academy Award, presented by the House of Squibb, a name you can trust. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>